Dear friends, I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar. The war is now in its 19th day and Israeli society and the Jewish people are mobilized in the best way uh, that we that 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 in all the war efforts um, and to we're hoping to get through this terrible period as best we can. The IMPJ continues to be mobilized in the emergency through the intense work of our humanitarian fund and heroic work of our rabbis with the people most impacted by the war like Rabbi Yael Vorgan, who you met in our last webinar. I want to thank all of our partners for their support, including the, the Union for Reform Judaism, Artsenu, the network of world reform Zionist movements, Arta, the Association of Reform Zionists of America, the World Union for Progressive Judaism, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the Association of American Cantors, Hebrew Union College, and the European Union for Reform Judaism. I truly apologize if I forgot one of our dear partners. The focus of tonight's webinar will be the stories of members of our movement who have family members held hostage by the Hamas terrorists. Additionally, you will hear impressions of a number of our leaders, both from Israel and the world. I'd like to now invite Rabbi Sergio Bergman, president of the <clears throat> World Union for Progressive Judaism to give his thoughts. Thank you, Anna. All of us around the world, we are an extended family, and we mourn those for those who are murdered before they were shot in our state, in our land, in Israel. We pray for the immediate release of the hostages. We offer praise for the refuah shlema for the thousand insurance in body and soul. We pray God will protect the brave man and women of Saal. The IDF defend both the land and people of Israel. Israel is in war, and you need to know that we stand beside all of you, no matter what. We are here, like this extended family war way, with our young leaders, Tamar and Netzer Lamy, working to stand by Israel and to make the distinction between the government of Israel and the state of Israel. In any place, in any condition, we stand by Israel. Because our reform movement includes the mitzvah to be Zionist. And we are facing anti-Semitism with a new face of anti-Zionism. We work with all of Israeli abroad. And they are part of our communities worldwide and part of our family. Our partnership with the IMPJ, the communities, and the Israelis that are giving us that, a civic society, the role model, what it means for us, the Qumran, how we really believe that Israel is an extended community that pursue the translation of the Torah in action. We are working close with all of you, bringing everything that we can to share with all of you this difficult time. We are one, we are a family, we are in pain, but also we are a resilient people. This is our strength in our identity, to become resilient. And the more important thing, we never, never give up because we keep our hope for a better future and a strong, sovereign, and healthy state of Israel. We never lose our hope, and the people of Israel is alive. I'm Israel High. Thank you, Rabbi Bergman. I want to invite Lee Siegel, our good friend, who serves as treasurer of Congregation Birkat Shalom at the Geza municipality, to tell us about his brother, Keith and his sister-in-law, Adrienne. 
Hello, good evening, good afternoon, whatever your time zone is. Yes, my name is Lee Siegel. I made Aliyah in 1976 to Kibbutz Gezer. Yerkat Shalom is our Reform congregation on the Kibbutz. For those who do not know, Rabbi Miri Gold was our establishing rabbi. Steve Bernstein is our current rabbi. My brother and sister-in-law's eldest child, their son Shai, who turns 40, turned 40 a few days ago, had his bar mitzvah on Kibbutz Gezer with Miri Gold. Uh, they live on Kibbutz Kfar Aza. Rabbi Yael in the area of Shara Negev is the rabbi that they know. A um, little bit of where I'm coming from, uh, I just returned from a vigil on Kaplan Street in Tel Aviv to free and return the hostages healthy and strong. Vigil has been going on for quite a while. Uh, we stand with signs and pictures of hostages. Cars drive by, yellow ribbons are tied onto the cars. There is a real feeling of solidarity where about three weeks ago, we were standing in defense of democracy and protesting the reality of a government that we felt is taking the country in the wrong direction. It is very difficult to be standing on that same street, trying to bring my brother, sister-in-law, and a very good friend from Kibbutz Be'eri, Vivian Silver, who was also at one point a member of Kibbutz Gezer. A lot of emotions. That is my brother and sister-in-law, Keith and Aviva. Uh, but at this point, a lot of us say we're numb. Uh, it's difficult to have expectations. We hold on, that's my brother Keith. Uh, Keith is 64 years old, Aviva is 62 years old. Aviva made Aliyah at the age of 10 from South Africa. My brother made Aliyah from the United States at the age of 20. We know that we cannot give up hope. Hope is what we have. And I have to be very honest and very clear the United States and all of you are what we have. We do not feel a lot of strength or support from our government in Israel. That is quite sad. There are many reasons for that. But the reality is um, myself and those who are American citizens are being held hostage and families of those hostages are privileged to have the North American Jewish community and the American government behind us. You cannot hear me? Are you not hearing me? We can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. There was a comment that I wasn't being heard. Um, very, very, very important to keep our foot on the pedal, as they say in local government, in state government, in federal government. We feel that the United States government is very genuine in this is at the top of our agenda. All hostages must come home. All hostages must be safe, not just American hostages. I think it's very important to stress that in whatever form you may be present. We, families of hostages, are members of a civilian forum that was started basically the day that hostages were taken, a non-governmental -gover organization for hostages and missing people. And as American citizens, we're members of a subset of that, uh, American citizens with family being held hostage. I would imagine you have been aware, are aware of the American Jewish Congress's work in this, bringing American Israelis from Israel to the United States, bringing 
American family members of hostages in the United States to all levels of government. I can't stress or repeat too many times how important that is for us. We are very happy that four women have been released. We can't allow this roller coaster to take us too far to either extreme. We understand, and that's what we've been told. This is a long process. The media is not particularly helpful. The media is chasing stories. My family has decided that we will go through political organizations and not yet step out into the limelight of Israeli media. We have been present in some American media. There's no problem sharing my name, Lee Siegel, my brother and sister-in-law, Keith. And actually, when she made Aliyah, the Sofnut messed up and her Tudat Saud and her passport name her as Adrian. Her name is Aviva, but in any formal communications, she is to be referred to as Adrian. I don't really know where to go without rambling too much. I probably sound rather detached. That is not because I am not emotional. That is not because I am not very worried. Uh, Keith and Aviva have four lovely children, three daughters and a son. They all felt it was their duty to serve on the border with Gaza when they did their army service. They have lived decades of lack of security. Their house on Far Aza was at the perimeter closest to Gaza. They have their son, their eldest, does still live on the kibbutz. Their daughters do not. They live in the north. They, the stress and trauma of so many years on the Gaza border. Uh, eventually push them further north, which is quite sad and disturbing. Their son Shai uh, lives on the kibbutz. He was there when the attack happened. He was not in the same house with his parents. They have no idea. They can only wonder what happened to Shai. After 30 hours, Shai was successfully evacuated. Shai is fine. He's with his sisters on a kibbutz up north, Kibbutz Gazit, which is a relatively, meanwhile, secure location in Israel. Uh, I won't repeat his story. Let's just say it was something that movies or Netflix series could base themselves on. He's a strong young man and a credit and we all have pride in what he was able to survive. And we're waiting for his parents, my brother and sister-in-law to return home. If, um, sorry. I was so moved by, uh, by a story. And, uh, and so Lee, thank you to Daraba. Thank you for giving us uh, the privilege of, of hearing you, of hearing about your brother and about your sister-in-law. And, uh, and we share in your concern. We're also concerned. Toda One thing I forgot to say, we do have confirmation as best confirmation can be had that they were taken early within Shabbat and they did cross the border and the army considers them to be held hostage. That is their situation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Yeah. I'm sure it was difficult to 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 share the story, and but but it's mostly difficult for for them right now. Toda raba. Toda. I I would like to invite. Anna Astomker, who serves as Director General of Keilat Kol Neshama, and her cousin Sasha Elayev, 
who will tell us about Sasha's sister, Karina. Hello, hey. Anna. Hi. Shalom. Hi, everyone. Shalom. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, so my name is Anna, and I'm the CEO of Kila uh, Kolen Shema Community uh, in Jerusalem. Um, my cousin Karina uh, was kidnapped by Hamas, and uh, her sister Sasha is sitting uh, next to me. Uh, so I will let her to tell about uh, her kidnapping. Hi, can Hello, you hear Sasha. me? Hi, I hear you. So I can also see the, the picture of my sister that is being shown to you. And I'm really touched. So I will introduce myself. My name is Sasha. I'm 24 years old. Uh, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And um, my sister also was born here. We have a five-year gap. My sister is 19 years old. And she was kidnapped from Nahal Oz outpost in the south parts of uh, Israel on the 7th of October. And I want to tell you a little bit about the story of the kidnapping as far as I know. Uh, it was uh, in the morning, 6.30 a.m. that my sister called me and said that she's being bombed. The, the place where she at is being bombed and that she and other girls as, are in a bomb shelter. And uh, first, uh, we all thought it is just going to be bombing and missiles firing. But uh, very soon we understood that there is something big happening. And my sister told me at 7, at 7 a.m. when she called the second time that uh, the bomb shelter is being raided by terrorists. And we could hear in the background of, uh, of, our, of the phone we could hear the Arabic dialect and the shooting uh, from the weapons and the girls in panic screaming and crying. And this was the last, uh, the last contact with my sister. While we were talking and maybe messaging a little bit on our WhatsApp family group, she wrote to me that if she won't make it alive, she wants me to be happy in my life and to take care of our parents, our uh, mother and father and not to sink in sorrow. And uh, I have this message uh, till now, of course, but I cannot open it uh, in our chat. It's, uh, it's too tough for me. And uh, at the same day, the evening, we saw a video on the Telegram channel and we recognized my sister in this video. She was uh, injured. She was uh, taken uh, hostage. She, she had blood on her face and she was screaming in some kind of vehicle or Jeep of the terrorists. And this was the last confirmation that she is alive. It was on the 7th of October evening. Since then, we only got a confirmation from the IDF and the government that my sister is being held hostage uh, in Gaza by Hamas or by the Islamic Jihad. Uh, they do not know for sure. But, um, but since then, it's already 19 days and we do not know anything. Uh, no one has confirmed that the hostages are alive or who is held, held there. The Red Cross, as you know, they didn't reach the hostages. And uh, sometimes I, I am I'm very sure you also know that uh, four kidnapped women were released. Two of them are American citizens and the other two are uh, Israeli elderly women. And from one uh, point of view, it gave us hope that maybe my sister can be released too. But from the other, uh, we are very maybe sorry that my sister doesn't have a second citizenship because we feel like the Israel are being forgotten. And my message to the world, to you, all the people who have joined us, is that please do not forget my sister's name, the name of Karina Ariev from Jerusalem, Israel. And every time that you are speaking to, to government people, to press, to media, um, if you are uploading some stories or posts, please think about her and make her name be, be heard because I want 
people not to forget her, not to forget that she is being held somewhere in a dark, scary place. And I want to ask you to please help us in any way that you can to put on pressure to bring back our Israeli, Israeli hostages. And um, remember her as a child, as an innocent uh, girl who, ha who have, I, want, I don't want to say had, but she, she still has a lot of dreams for the future. And I'm sure that she's scared and afraid, but she's, but she's strong, I'm sure about it. And I'm just, I'm just in full darkness and I want any help I can get um, to bring our hostages back home, uh, including of course, my sister Karina. And I want to tell you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell uh, our story, my sister's story, and then uh, to address you all the people who are with us now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you, Anna. We hold you and your family in our hearts and in our prayers, and we will certainly pray for them this uh, Motzei Shabbat, when our movement will be on Kaplan with the other families uh, holding Avdala and, and praying. Toda Raba. I uh, now would like to introduce Will Brockman, a student in the HUC First Year in Jerusalem program, who will be followed by Rabbi M.K. Gilad Kariv, Daryl Messenger, Chair of Artsa, and Rabbi Rick Jacobs, President of the URJ. Vivakasha, Will. Thank you, Anna, uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I am, as you heard, a first year student at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in the Cantorial Program. And this has been a, a tumultuous few weeks for all of us who are studying for the year in Israel, as it has been for the entire country of Israel. About half of our class, the year in Israel class, has decided to leave Israel for the moment uh, with hopes to return sometime in the near future. But about half of us, myself included, have chosen to remain in Jerusalem. And I can only speak for myself, but for myself, I never had a question in my mind that I would stay here. I believe that Ahavat Yisrael is one of the dearest values we have as Jews. And it has been a privilege and an incredible learning experience in my first year of Cantorial School to be able to help, to be able to volunteer in whatever ways I have been able to. Some of us uh, who are eligible have been giving blood. Uh, we've also been creating boxes of food for people from elsewhere in the country who need supplies. Um, I, this past Friday, had the privilege of leading Kabbalah Shabbat services for people from the north, from the town of Shalomi, near the border with Lebanon, who had come to find safety in Jerusalem. And I consider this to be really pivotal and important in my training and to have it so early on. It has been a privilege, not just to be able to stand with Israel, but to be standing in Israel at this time. Um, so thank you everyone for listening to what I've had to say and I'm Yisrael Chai. Shalom, chaverim. Good evening, good afternoon. Um, first, uh, let me thank you all for the, joining this uh, important and moving uh, uh, webinar. It's a real testimony, testimony for your uh, uh, love and your commitment to this uh, value of Klal, uh, of Klal Israel. I just uh, returned from a kibbutz Shfaim, uh, a kibbutz that is hosting. Uh, 120 families from Kibbutz uh, Kfar Aza. I went there to pay my condolences to the grieving uh, uh, families. Some of them are sitting Shiva while they are uh, caught in this unbelievable situation of uh, having uh, uh, close relatives, members of their uh, family 
in the ends of uh, in the ends of Hamas. My uh, prayers and thoughts are with Lee, with Anna, with Sasha. Thank you, Will, for your uh, important and brave decision to stay with us. It's a uh, Again, it's a testimony to your uh, leadership, uh, your religious and communal leadership, and thank you for that. Uh, dear, uh, dear friends, uh, first I would like uh, uh, to thank you all for your uh, strong support to the State of Israel, to the IDF soldiers, and to all of us in the Israeli reform, uh, in the Israeli reform movement. We are fully aware to the fact, and now I'm talking in as, as an Israeli politician, that it is not only a moment of uh, supporting Israel. We are fully aware to the fact that the current events uh, carry a huge impact on the well-being of Jewish life outside Israel. And that uh, as communal leaders, you are called also to address the rise of anti-Semitism and many, many um, domestic and global challenges that are being strengthened by, uh, by the current events in, uh, in Israel. As a member of the opposition and as a member of the Knesset uh, uh, National Security and Foreign Affairs Committee, I would like to say that all of us, opposition and coalition, we are all united in this uh, basic understanding that Israel cannot allow itself to go back to the reality that existed uh, till October 7th, 7th in regard to the situation in the Gaza, in the Gaza uh, Strip. We are fully aware that this uh, bilateral uh, uh, battle and match with Hamas can easily transfer itself to be a regional, uh, a regional conflict. And it demands us, and especially uh, the commanders of the IDF and the Israeli, the current Israeli government, to navigate this uh, crisis uh, extremely uh, carefully and with wisdom. And we are grateful to the partnership uh, uh, with Western uh, uh, governments, especially with the um, American, uh, American administration. And this understanding that this uh, bilateral battle can transform itself to be a regional uh, a conflict has a second, uh, a second aspect. There is a second side, another side to this uh, a coin. We fully understand that the result of this uh, uh, battle with Hamas will carry a huge impact on the way other extreme players in the Middle East uh, understand uh, uh, the strength of Israel and its ability to defend itself. And this understanding that Israel must change the reality in the Gaza Strip and make sure that Hamas cannot uh, design the reality in this uh, uh, crowded uh, uh, piece of land uh, is deeply connected to the regional threats that are coming from Hezbollah and for many, many other, uh, other extreme players that are led by, uh, by Iran. I can fully assure you that the IDF is sensitive to the uh, laws of war, to the international laws of war, and to the uh, laws of, uh, of, um, of human treatment towards our, uh, our enemies. Uh, uh, this is definitely something which is on the table of the decision makers in Israel. And I'm telling that uh, uh, because I know it as a, as a fact. Our tradition teaches us that uh, we are not only allowed, we are called to think also about the uh, suffer of our uh, enemies. We are not ignoring it. But again, Israel has a sacred com a commitment to uh, defend its citizens. And when we are talking about uh, returning the hostages back to their families, we know it is a combination of uh, international political efforts, but also 
uh, it's the result or the a future result of the military pressure that will be uh, uh, pressed on the uh, on the Hamas. The last comment I want to make has to do with our uh, vision in regard to the uh, best way to solve the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. I assume the vast majority of us believe that in the end, we need to find a political solution to this uh, uh, terrible, uh, terrible conflict. And here again, we need to say that if we believe a political solution must be found to this uh, conflict, we cannot allow the extreme forces to determine the future of this re uh, region. And if Hamas prevails in the eyes of the Palestinians and in the eyes of some of our neighbors, it will mean that in the near future, there will be no pragmatic partners to renew, uh, to renew the political process to solve the conflict. And as a strong believer of the two-state solution, I strongly believe that Israel needs to change the reality in the Gaza Strip with all the necessary sensitivities in order to enable a new political process between us and the Palestinians to, to emerge. So together with all of us, I pray for the return of all the hostages uh, back I'm uh, paying my condolences to the families of more than 1,500 Israelis that lost their life uh, in this uh, uh, terrible, uh, uh, terrible uh, uh, war. And I want again to thank you all for your long-standing leadership and support for the state of Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Gilad, and thank you for your leadership in these very, very difficult times. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Dear friends, I have the great honor and responsibility of representing the reform movement on the JFNA's Israel Emergency Allocations Committee. I so wish that I did not have this honor, but it is one of the very few things right now that gives me hope and purpose. I want to tell you about that effort and ask you each to please join me and contribute to this vital campaign. The link is in the chat and more information will be sent with a follow-up email. In the almost three weeks since this terrible pogrom started, JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America, and the broader Jewish ecosystem in North America have raised almost $400 million in commitments. That is a lot of money, but unfortunately we know that we will need much more than that to resettle, rebuild and invest after this terrible war is over. Every gift matters. This is not something that any one federation any one organization, foundation, or individual can sustain. Already in the 15 days since the Allocations Committee was formed, we have committed over $70 million of funds and earmarked many millions more for future efforts. I am happy to report, if this is something to be, it, it is to be proud of, to report that the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism, the IMPJ's requests for emergency funds for support to serve our community and those with special needs has already received significant JFNA funding. I know that there are many worthy and worthwhile places we each can and should contribute. Nonetheless, the level of cooperation creative thinking and determination that I'm seeing across the Jewish philanthropic world is incredible. It is vitally important right now that our efforts be coordinated to have the scale and impact that is necessary in this moment, that we pool our resources and use the impressive knowledge, expertise, and experience 
of staff at JFNA, the Jewish Agency, and others in Israel to determine where the greatest needs exist and who is best suited to meet it. And let me assure everyone, this doesn't mean that the funds are only going to the usual suspects. We are focused on those who can deliver results, whether they are recently formed NGOs around the pro-democracy movement, such as Brothers and Sisters in Arms, or Orthodox First Responders, Zaka, or our own IMPJ. To date, we've supported aid for the roughly 200,000 individuals and families who have been evacuated from their homes, wide-scale trauma relief and psychosocial support through, through telephone hotlines and direct care to first responders, lone soldiers, the injured, and families whose relatives were murdered, injured, or abducted. Targeted assistance to vulnerable populations and their caregivers, including the elderly, young children, people living with disabilities, and smaller populations, including the IMPJ, the Masorti or conservative movement, as well as ultra-Orthodox, LGBTQ+, and Bedouin communities. Critical medical equipment and supplies to hospitals closest to Gaza, which have treated hundreds of wounded and injured. If you have any questions about particular organizations or want to know more specifics, please reach out. We will include more information on our movement websites. If you reside outside of North America, please consult the Artsenu website as how best to contribute to the IMPJ or the World Union for Progressive Judaism directly. Please be generous. Now more than ever, we must stand with Israel and show that we are there for all of her inhabitants. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl, for not just that uh, very succinct and compelling report, but for your leadership in advocating not only for our institutions, but our values in the allocations from the JFNA funds. Friends, I am speaking to you from Jerusalem, where I've been for the last few days, and there's a simple uh, feeling of not only solidarity, but the weight of this moment is felt wherever you go with whomever you speak with. Um, I had the privilege yesterday of sitting for a few minutes with Israel's president, uh, Isaac Herzog, who is a close and dear friend of the reform movement, not only in Israel, but also uh, in North America and around the world. And it was important to him. He had yet another busy day. We had heads of state here, including uh, President Macron from France. But he knew how important our movement is to not just this moment, but the long term strength of the Israel uh, US and Canada relationship. So I sat with uh, President Herzog. And the first thing I wanted to say to him is, on behalf of the reform movement, President Herzog, we are with you. We stand with the state of Israel shoulder to shoulder. This is a moment when we are feeling the pain and the loss, and frankly, the vulnerability. And I wanted him to know that the strength of this reform movement is solidly and very, very deeply connected, not only to um, the state, but the people and uh, all the different uh, areas where we need to be working very, very intensely. Uh, this morning, uh, another Shiva. Uh, this Shiva was for the family of Ofer Lipstein, who many of you know was the mayor of uh, not only Shara Negev, but really a force in the communities around the Gaza Strip. He was a just inspirational individual who not only dreamt, but he had a plan to build more economic interdependence between the communities along the Gaza border in Israel and across the border in Gaza. He was one of the most idealistic and most committed people, and he fell on the first day on the, the remarkably horrific day that we will remember for centuries to come, October 7th. Uh, we hoped against hope that his son, Nitsan would be, imagine this, we were hoping that he would be found to be a hostage, but it turns out 14 days after his father was, was murdered, uh, Ofer's son, Nitsan was, uh, was found and was also killed. 
So we've paid a shiva call today to Ophir's widow and Nitzan's mother, Vered, and met with the family. And it turns out that Vered's mother also uh, died in recent days. So this is a family that's been sitting shiva and shiva and shiva. Friends, this is the moment. Uh, you walk into Shvaim, where um, MK Rabbi Gilad Kariv was today. I was, I was there as well. And there are lists of all the different places and all the different families that are sitting Shiva. And these are families that all know one another. So, so they're going, frankly, from uh, morning tent to morning tent to feel the strength of this community. This is just not something any of us have ever experienced. What I wanna say uh, really clearly is our rabbis and our reform movement leaders here in Israel are inspirational. Obviously you were welcomed by Anna Kislansky, who's the CEO of the Israel Movement for Progressive Reform Judaism, incredible leader. Yair Luchstein, the chair of the IMPJ board also, so busy doing all of the very, very important things, sometimes very mundane things, but serving this community. And of course, Orly Erez Lechovsky. And I wanted to say a word about our rabbis. Uh, at Kfar Aza, where so many of our very deep connections were felt, there have already been 60 funerals. One out of 10 people on the kibbutz are gone. It, the weight that our rabbis are carrying, and Rabbi Yael Vurgan, just uh, all day today with her, the way that she cares for her community in Shara Negev, and they're spread out there. Some of them are in Tel Aviv, some are in the north in uh, Shvaim, some are in Nachal, in Nachal Oz, which is one of the surrounding communities of Kfar Aza, Nachal Oz, there at Mishmar Emek in the north. So she goes from community to community to be with her people. She goes from morning tent to morning tent to sit with those uh, in Shiva. Uh, these are rabbis who are carrying the weight of the world. And as a rabbi myself who served a community during a 9-11, the weight of the mourning and the sadness is extraordinary. And these rabbis are doing heroic, heroic work. I just wanna say a couple of sentences. Uh, this afternoon when we were in Mishmara Emek, we met with uh, the remarkable community of Nachal Oz, which is one of the kibbutzim right on the border. And uh, Jen Coffin and I actually were, were, were there in that community to celebrate Shabbat. And many of you, we, you heard on our last webinar, Amir Tibon tell the unreal story of the rescue that his father, uh, General Noam Tibon, was able to effect for, for Amir's family and his wife, Miri, and their two kids. Well, uh, in, in this gathering this afternoon, uh, Amir and Miri were there along with others and their stories about what they experienced, the hours upon hours that they were sitting in the darkness uh, with young children, uh, hoping against hope that the um, IDF would be able to come rescue them, that somebody would rescue them. Uh, the pain that they're carrying, the feeling of having endured something uh, simply unreal is, uh, is just incredibly uh, burdensome, I think, to to hear and to want to alleviate that pain. But of course, that pain is uh, is widely felt. I want to also just lift up, uh, I was very moved by the sharing today by Lee and by Anna and, and Sasha. I sat yesterday with, uh, with Anna Kislansky and David Bernstein and the whole team with this remarkable institution that's fighting on behalf of the hostages. They are unbelievably organized. They have diplomats, they have fundraisers, they have health professionals, they have people who are expert in social media. And we sat with families, in addition to the two incredible stories we heard today, we sat with others who said, please don't forget our loved ones. Please make sure that the reform movement stands up and pressures those who can affect change. Can I just say, uh, President Joe Biden has been extraordinary. Not only did he show up here and express such love for, for Israel and the Israeli people, he also prioritized bringing the hostages home. He said that was at the top of his to-do list in thinking about this moment. So the families have been asking us very loudly for us to prioritize. So one of the things that you'll hear uh, tomorrow in particular is that we are doing a number of campaigns 
to bring more activism and awareness to the plight of these hostages, uh, over 200. And of course, we've actually discovered a few more. Some have come out, four have come out of uh, captivity, but others have been discovered. This is our fight, friends. And as you heard, it's not only for those who have a, a dual citizenship, Israel and uh, U.S. or maybe France and Israel. This is for all the hostages. They are all our family members. And I know that uh, some of us will see tomorrow the, the campaign is going to wear a blue ribbon. Again, blue, our color of Israel, to show that this is something that we would want our neighbors and our, our colleagues at work to ask us about and we could tell them. We also want to make sure that our elected officials know that we care deeply about this and to thank them if they've been uh, outspoken and uh, active on this, but we can't do enough. And also with our interfaith partners to ask those local faith leaders to stand with us and to help bring the hostages home. Uh, I want to also say I had a chance to uh, sit with uh, Ariel Fogelman, who leads all of our Israel summer activities. Uh, last summer, he oversaw bringing 700 uh, North Americans to Israel for the summer. Ariel is in reserve duty. His unit is one of education. So he's been on the border of Gaza. He's been on the north of the border of Lebanon. He's been in the Golan Heights. His work is to help prepare soldiers, not on all the military aspects, but all of the things to give them a sense of cohesion. But he also, in his, in his presentations, talks about Ruach HaTzahal, which is the IDF's ethics code. And one of the things he does for reserve soldiers is to remind them that in the conduct of war, the state of Israel uh, adheres to the highest ethical standards and to remind them in the course of whatever awaits them in their service to this country and our people and our values, that that ethics code is uh, something that we uphold. Uh, I wanna also just conclude by saying, um, this is a moment, friends, that uh, we can't run out of our energy. Our, our people need us. Uh, the Jewish state needs us. And what's amazing is that we were debating in all of our thoughtful differences about policy, some of them very profound. In this moment, we stand with those who are more conservative, more liberal, more orthodox, more secular. It doesn't matter. We stand together. And that's the expression we brought to other politicians who said, what's the reform movement doing? And the answer is a lot. And I hope with all of your activism, we can even do more. That's our work. So I conclude with a tiny bit of Torah from this week's Torah portion. Obviously the setting forth for Abraham and Sarah on their Jewish journey, the first two Jewish people set out on a journey. And early on that journey, they get caught up in a, in a battle between these kings. And all of a sudden Abraham's nephew Lot is taken hostage. What does Abraham do? He doesn't only pray. He doesn't only hope that Lot is released. He gathers up a group of, uh, of people to come with him, and they go and find and, and bring Lot back. That's what we do. The Torah teaches us, our hearts teach us, and this moment demands of us. So I hope that you'll continue to contribute to uh, the JFNA's emergency fund so we can really bring more resources to our movement and to the things we care about, our values. I hope that you'll do your activism on behalf of the hostages. I hope, I'm just gonna say this, this is a moment we're gonna see, um, we just heard that there's gonna be an additional delay in whatever ground incursion is going to take place. There's more of a delay. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke to the nation tonight. But the truth is uh, we're needed in this moment. The last thing I wanna say is, um, as, as Rabbi Gilad Kariv is always our teacher, always a rabbi, always uh, an upholder of ethics. Uh, we can be 150% supportive of Israel and our people, our soldiers in uniform, and at the same exact moment, have human empathy and concern for the innocent, the innocent uh, Palestinians in Gaza, who are also in some ways are held hostage by Hamas. We're gonna be determined to in every way weaken Hamas's ability to uh, begin another assault and uh, butcher our, our families. So we're gonna continue to do that, but we're not gonna ever lose 
our humanity. I heard that from the people we met with today and yesterday. That is exactly the kind of Jewish complexity that we live every day. We can be bold in our support and human in our experience of others. So let's bring all those elements together. Let's stand strong and let's stand together. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobs. And thank you for coming to Israel to be with us. This is really strengthening and very much appreciated. I want to thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We have a very long journey ahead, and we're working hard to bring hope to the people of Israel and the Jewish people for a better future and of continued building of the state of Israel as our Jewish and democratic homeland. We are very grateful for the outpouring of support. Please continue to pressure your elected official and other people with influence regarding the need to free all the hostages. We are grateful for this financial support for our efforts in Israel. Please support your local federation campaigns in North America and other reform movement campaigns in other places. Please join us again this Friday, the day after tomorrow, for our Solidarity Shabbat, plan planned by all the partners of the World Reform Community. We will hear a final song from our cantors, and then together end this call with the singing of Hatikva.